what would that be as a fraction? Uh, one and one half, or three halves. Right. Well, that gives us our ratio. You can see that sometimes we have to do a little work to figure out what the ratio is. But this is about 1.5, which looks like a ratio of 2 to 3. That means that it seems like this is representing three hydrogens for every two hydrogens over here. However, that doesn't tell us the actual numbers. There could be two hydrogens in A and three hydrogens in B. Or there could be four hydrogens in A and six hydrogens in B. Correct. Or there could be six hydrogens in A and nine hydrogens in B. Do you see where I'm getting these numbers? If I take the original two to three ratio and I just multiply these two numbers by two, I get four to six. Or if I take the original ratio and multiply by three, I get six to nine. Or I can multiply by four to get eight to 12. Well, how can I figure out which of these is the correct number of hydrogens? It's not very difficult because we know what the total number of hydrogens is supposed to be. Therefore, we know that this must be the actual numbers of hydrogens, because this is the only one that adds up to 10. This is how we can use the information from the area to figure out exactly how many hydrogens each of these peaks represents. Now we know that group A has four hydrogens and group B has six hydrogens. One thing to notice is I haven't even started trying to draw the whole structure yet. It's very important to be methodical in these problems. We should not just jump in trying to draw the structure. Instead, there's a bunch of preliminary work that we have to do first before we can draw the whole structure. Now I'm even going to erase this 33 and this 48, because this is not interesting to me anymore, because I've figured out the information that I need from that, the four hydrogens and the six hydrogens. All right. This is a good notation for when you know the number of hydrogens. The number plus the letter H is, is the typical conventional notation to indicate the number of hydrogens. Okay. we are still not going to try to draw the whole structure. Instead, we're going to try to draw the fragments that these peaks represent. We're going to try to draw the fragments that these peaks represent. Well, focusing on this 6H over here, what could this represent? Well, one thing that it's most likely to represent is two methyl groups, a CH3 group, two of these CH3 groups. Now, it's important to realize this is just a guess. After all, instead of being two CH3 groups, it could be three CH2 groups, right? However, as a, this, is, uh, this is a good guess to start with. And if it doesn't work, about work, we could try it supposing this was three CH2 groups. We'll start with this. And now, working on this fragment, here's a very important step. How many hydrogens should be on this adjacent carbon? Well, we saw here that N was two. So if this is a methyl group, it should be adjacent to a CH2 group. I'll label these as group B. Do you see why if we suppose this is a CH3 group, it has to be adjacent to a CH2 group because this was a triplet? Does that make sense? Yes. OK. OK. Because there was only two peaks here, because there was only two peaks here, we actually already know what group the CH2 group would have to be. Because there was only two peaks here, the CH2 group over here would have to represent peak A. Because we only have two peaks. So these would have to represent group A if our guesses are correct. Okay. Well, let's test whether that's really possible. Does this seem to match what we would expect from group A? Well, we know that the N for group A is three. There should be three hydrogens adjacent to group A. That seems to be matching up over here. So this, this is confirming our original guesses, that this seems like a good guess over here. So notice again, we're not trying to draw the whole structure. We're trying to draw the fragments that correspond to these peaks. And now we've drawn the fragments, and now we have to start trying to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Well, how many carbons are unaccounted for here? I've got one, two, and here's another three, four. There's only one more carbon to account for. Mm -hmm. So I'll also draw this fourth carbon. Here, now this is the last carbon that we haven't accounted for yet. And we also have an oxygen that we haven't accounted for. 
Okay. And somehow we need to put these fragments together in a way that's going to be consistent with all the information. And we know we're either going to have one ring or one pi bond. We have to decide where to put the oxygen. Does it look like the oxygen is attached to the, to the B carbon? Let's take a look at this data here. Is the oxygen no. attached to this B carbon? No, because this, this is not nearly far enough to the left. And does it seem like the oxygen is attached to the A carbon? Well, still no, because this is still to the right of 2.5. Remember that if a, carbon, if a hydrogen is on a carbon with an electronegative element, we would expect that to be the left of 2.5, not to the right. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can confirm that in our spectroscopic data here. If we're on a carbon with an oxygen, that would get put us here in the 3.4 to 4 region, or here in the 3.3 to 4.0 region or here above 3.7. It looks like all these different cases where you're on a carbon with an oxygen, you're definitely to the left of 2.5. So it looks like this carbon also doesn't have the oxygen. So I'm not going to put the oxygen here, okay. because that would have pulled group A further to the left. Sure. That means the oxygen really has to be connected to this extra carbon mm -hmm. over here. Now we have to find some way to put these fragments together. Well, I can't just connect this fragment to this fragment, because then there would be no room for this. So really, at this point, I've got to put this carbon in. This carbon has to go here. And then attached to this carbon, We can put this other fragment. So now I'm starting to try to put the fragments together. So do you see where I got this from? Or not? No, I, I, I wasn't. You what you wrote when I wasn't uh, okay. Can you, can you chop off well, the, uh, everything after the carbon with the oxygen? Well, oh, so do you see where we got this from? Yes. Okay. Well, remember there's five carbons overall. Mm -hmm. This now accounts for three of them, mm -hmm. but we still have these two to account for. Okay. Well, where can I connect them? There's only one place left to connect them. This carbon over here, because these carbons are full. Mm -hmm. These carbons are full. I, I, I just got confused because you list them there and then you retain them down below. Yeah, maybe now I can erase this fragment because we placed it someplace. That's a good point. Once you know where a fragment goes, we don't need to include it anymore. This is kind of like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. We're trying to see how the pieces fit together. All right. And now to finish off, this carbon doesn't have a full octet yet. That's uh, one question now. The hydrogen deficiency determines uh, pi bonds on carbons? It determines the total number of pi bonds, period. Okay, so it can be a pi bond from a carbon to an oxygen. That's right. Okay. The total number of pi bonds, period. Well, maybe you're already seeing that we could put in a pi bond here to satisfy the complete octet. I certainly can't put another hydrogen here because we've already accounted for all the hydrogen, so we really have no choice. We have to put another pi bond in here. And now let's make sure that this really matches our data up here. Well, notice that this is what we called before our second quadrant. This is the, the area that we saw when you're, you're not on a carbon with an electronegative atom, but you're adjacent to an, a carbon with an electronegative atom. Okay. Well, that's exactly what group A is here. The group A hydrogens, the group A carbon is not attached to an electronegative element, but it's adjacent to this carbon with an electronegative element. So this is the exact place that we would expect that absorption between 1.25 and 2.5. And then this is too far away from the electronegative development to be affected too much. It's still in our first quadrant between 0 and 1.25. Okay. But it's kind of to the left of that region because it is being affected somewhat by this oxygen. So everything seems to match up with this assignment here. So it turns out that it looks like this, uh, this molecule didn't turn out to have any rings. Instead, it had a pi bond. Given that we knew there was two, that we were guessing there was two methyl groups, it would be really hard here to make a ring sure. when we already had these two methyl groups pointing out.
Now to be extra sure, let's just make sure that we can really confirm this with the specific absorptions in our table. Let's see if we can find these group A hydrogens in our table. What rate row would the group A hydrogens be? Well, we need this carbon-oxygen double bond down here. But are we in this region or this region? Well, we've got a carbon that's, the, the, the carbon is not just connected to the carbon, but let's also get another carbon. So we should be in the 2.2 to 2.6 region? Yes. Does that match what we got? Yes. Yeah. That also matches what we got here. So now, we, before we were just using our rules of thumb, but now when we actually look this up in the table, this absorption is in the exact right place to be next to this carbonyl group. Yes. 